This video covers the Vale, House Erin, and the castle known as Vieri. In the future, I may do more detailed videos focusing on each topic individually. The sacred book of the Andals, named the Seven-Pointed Star, spoke of a golden land amidst towering mountains. Hugor of the Hill, the first Andal king who reigned in Andalos, received a vision of a land that the Andals would one day call their home. In the east of Westeros lies a wide, fertile valley surrounded by tall, green-covered peaks of the Mountains of the Moon. This land is known as the Vale of Arryn, and it is grand. All over the Vale, the Andals carved their seven-pointed star and images of a sword and the axe. While in Westeros, the Vale of Arryn is isolated from the rest of the Seven Kingdoms by the Mountains of the Moon. This worked in the favor of the Andals, as they would be able to secure their foothold in Westeros without worry of enemies crossing their borders. When the Andals crossed the Narrow Sea to a land in the Vale, they were confronted by the First Men, who had already settled there centuries before. The First Men fought hard, but the Andals were too many, and the First Men were too few. The singers told of the endless stream of Andal invaders, of how the First Men would burn an Andal longship, and the next dawn, ten more would appear. Moreover, the Andals had steel armor and blades, which would slice right through the bronze that the First Men used. But by far, the largest problem the First Men faced was their division. The Vale was split among many small kingdoms, and the First Men kings did not unite when the Andals first arrived. Some of the First Men made alliances and pacts with the Andals, or would pay them to destroy their enemies. This sort of interaction would be repeated later as the Andals conquered other parts of Westeros. John Brightstone, and Divine Shell both claimed the titles of king, both wanting to rule over the fingers. Both of them paid Andal warlords to cross the Narrow Sea in the hopes that they would fight for their claim. When the Andal warlords landed in the fingers, they turned their blades against the claimants, and within a year had captured John Brightstone, torturing him and later beheading him. Dwine Shell was burned alive inside his great wooden long hole. One of the Andal knights, Corwin Corbray, took Brightstone's daughter for his wife, and Dwine Shell's wife, into his ownership. Corwin Corbray did not name himself king, but instead became Lord of the Fingers. The harbor city known as Gultown was ruled by Osgood Chet, the third of his name. Osgood claimed the ancient title known as King of the Truman, a title that could be traced to the Dawn Age. Gultown had strong stone walls and was relatively safe, but King Osgood's armies were slowly being depleted in his war against the Bronze King of Runestone. The Bronze Kings were known by the name Royce, and their name was as ancient as King Osgood Shets. With his father slain in battle, Yorwick Royce claimed the runic crown and went on to destroy the Shet armies, forcing Osgood's men back inside the walls of Goldtown. Desperate, King Osgood turned to Andalos for help. He helped to bind his alliance in blood and to recover his lost lands. Osgood married the daughter of the Andal Knight, Sir Geralt Grafton chose heir, and gave his own daughter to become Sir Geralt's wife. The weddings were carried out by Septons, and King Osgood Shet converted to the Faith of the Seven, and promised to build a Septon Goldtown. The Goldtown army then marched from the gates of Goldtown with their Andal allies. The battle was fierce, and Osgood's army won but not without losses. King Osgood Chet was among the fallen. Some first men believed Chet's and ally, Sir Geralt Grafton, had struck him down himself. The Andal warlords locked Osgood's heir in his chamber and claimed the title of king. The people of Gultown took to the streets, but King Grafton destroyed the uprising, killing thousands and throwing their bodies into the Bay of Crabs. House Grafton would go on to rule Gultown for many years. King Geralt was wise, and the town prospered under his rule growing massively to become the Vale's first city. In these early years, many of the First Men rulers made the same mistakes of dealing with the Andals. Eventually, this for the most part came to an end, and First Men kings like the Bronze King, Yarwick of Runestone, waged brutal wars against the Andals. The Runic King defeated the Andals many times, destroying their ships and mounting the heads of the captains and crews in his hall. His heirs continued the wars, which went on for generations. The final Bronze King was known as Robert II, grandson of the Runic King Yorwick Royce. Robar II was a mighty warrior, absolutely destroying his opponents in battle. He nearly stemmed the tide of Andals pouring into his domain. The Andals had already taken over three-fourths of the land and had started to fight each other over the taken lands, just like the first men they had taken them from. Robar saw the Andal in fighting as his greatest opportunity to take back the Vale. 
All across the Vale, there were horsemen who had been fighting the Endels without defeat. Some of them were the Redforts of Redforts, the Hunters of Longbow Hall, the Belmores of Strongsong, and the Cold Waters of Coldwater Burn. King Robar II allied himself with each of his firstmen factions, along with other clans and minor houses. The methods he used to unite these houses varied, from marriage to gold, promises of land and so on. The Lord Hunter of Longbow Hall was defeated in an archery contest by King Robar, and they joined his cause as well. Legend has it that Robar cheated. The great King Robar even managed to sway Ursula Upcliffe to his side, a sorceress who claimed to be the Merlin King's bride. All those that Robar had gathered kneeled before Rune King Robar Royce the second of his name, proclaiming him the High King of the Vale, the Fingers, and the Mountains of the Moon. With the last of the First Men united under one leader, their power against the Andals rose tremendously. Victory after victory, the First Men broke and divided the Andals one by one. Ironically, some of the Andal Lords allied themselves with the First Men, so that they could together defeat other Andals. In the battle against the Kingdom of the Fingers, Robar Royce struck the hand of Quile Corbray, causing him to drop his Valyrian steel sword, Lady Forlorn. King Corbray was slain in battle, felled by the runic King's blade. Robar had his sister enter Goldtown and persuade the Shets to rise against the Graftons and open the city gates which they did, returning Goldtown to the First Men. An Andal king known as the Hammer of the Hills was next, and Robar's army marched towards Iron Oaks. The Hammer of the Hills fell beneath the walls of Iron Oaks. Only King Robar II of House Royce was unstoppable, and the First Men believed that they would soon retake the entire Vale. However, like the First Men, the Andals realized that separately they stood no chance, and so united under their own single leader. The Andal kings and lords put aside their petty infighting and took up the sword, under the banners of their own hero. This hero was no king. He wasn't even a lord. Sir Artis Aaron was a knight, of an equal age to Robar II. Artis was the finest swordsman of all the living Andals, and with Horse, Lance, and Morningstar, he was unstoppable. Along with his combat skills, Artis was cunning and a leader. Artis Aaron was born of pure Andal blood, in the shadow of a giant's lance among the soaring falcons. His shield was decorated with a soaring moon and falcon, and his silver helmet sprouted wings. To his men, he was known as the Falcon Knight. After much preparation, the Andal host under the Falcon Knight marched to meet Robar II's mighty host of horsemen. The armies, relatively equal in number, met below the giant's lance, near the birthplace of Artizarin. Robar had already set up a strong position with the mountains and hills to his back, and the Andal army would have to fight their way uphill. In front of Robar's army were lions and trenches, inside were thousands of sharpened stakes lined with foul substances. Nearly all of the first men were on foot, while the Andals had better armor and ten times as much cavalry. When the Andals finally came, the sun was setting. The Falcon Knight's men set up their camps with inside of the enemy, and both sides rested before the coming battle. During that night, heavy clouds covered the moon, and the only light came from the thousands of tents on either side of the river. A few times during that dark night before the battle, archers loosed arrows at the opposite camps, hoping to kill a few foes before the real battle began. When the sun finally rose, the men in the Andal camps saw seven shining stars and roared in approval, declaring that the gods were with them. The war horns roared, and the Andal vanguard charged across the fields, and the first men stood their ground. The Andals charged seven times into the first men, and all but the seventh charge were pushed back. On the seventh charge, the Andals broke the first men lines and engaged in fierce combat. This attack was led by the huge warrior named Torgold Tillets, but known as Torgold the Grim. He fought the first men laughing, with his chest bare and seven-pointed star painted on it. He held a mighty axe in each of his hands. Torgold was set to be fearless, and was set to feel no pain. He slaughtered his way through Lord Redford's best warriors, and took Lord Redford's arm off with a single mighty swing. At this point, he had left both of his axes in the bodies of slain foes, and ran forward, weaponless and bare-chested. Ahead, Ursula Upcliffe, the sorcerer, spotted him, and attempted to cast a curse on him. Torgold Tolet leaped into the air and grabbed hold of a witch's head, ripping it from her body. Vandal warriors poured into the gap he had made, and the battle turned into a chaotic mess. The first men wavered, and to most men, it looked like the Andals had won the day. To Robar II, however, it looked like a chance to smash the Andal push. Surrounded by his best champions, Robar countercharged, wielding the Valyrian steel blade Lady Forlorn. After obliterating the Andal vanguard, Varuni King Robar II of House Royce saw Torgol Tillet, 
He charged at him, bringing Lady Forlorn down onto Torgold's head. Torgold used his bare hands to grab the blade, laughing as he did so. The Valerian steel sliced right through his hand and destroyed Torgold's skull. The singers say that the giant Torgold died laughing. As Torgold collapsed, Robar saw the Falcon Knight and charged once more. He hoped the Endos would fall back if their High King was slain in battle. Finally, the two warriors met in the center of that bloody battle. Andals and first men falling left and right. King Robar wore bronze armor and wielded a Valerian steel blade, while the Falcon Knight wore silvered steel, but his blade could not compare. The duel lasted only a few seconds, as Lady Forlorn, being made from the fabled Valerian steel, sliced through the Falcon Knight's helm with ease. The Falcon Knight fell from his saddle, and Robar knew the battle was won. The trumpets were loud and came from behind Robar. Turning in his saddle, Robar's heart sank. Five hundred Andal Knights were pouring down the giant's lance like a silver waterfall. The first men were taken by surprise, and many broke immediately. In the very front rode Artie's Arian, his falcon and moonshield clearly visible. His silver helm sprouted wings. The cunning Sir Artis had clad one of his knights in a spare suit of armor, while he himself had taken his best horseman through a goat truck he had remembered from him when he was a child. The final army of the first men was annihilated. Thirty lords fought under King Robar's banner, but by the end of the battle, all were slain. Many claim the killing of Robar Royce. Many would tell you it was Sir Artis himself who had done the deed. Others might tell you it was Lucian Templeton, the Knight of Nine Stars, or Lord Rufmans. House Corbre of Hart's home claims the honor, and they hold Lady Forlorn, the sword used by Robar to prove it. They say Sir Jaime Corbre was the one to swing the final blow. Afterwards, the Septons and the Singers told tales about the Battle of the Seven Stars, of how King Robar Royce and Sir Artis Aaron fought one another under the Giant's Lance, and how the victory of Sir Artis was so severe that the First Men of the Vale would never recover from it. Over 14 ancient houses of the Vale were ended, the ones which survived, like the Redforts, the Hunters, and Coldwaters. The Belmores and the Royces only survived because they gave up gold and lands and hostages, and bent the each of a new King Artis Aaron of the Mountains and Vale in exchange for their lives. Over the ages, some of the defeated houses would go on to become great once again, regaining lands, wealth, and pride. The Vale, that the First Men once called their own, would forever be known as the Vale of Aaron, named after the Andal Houses. Once the battle had been won, people would spread the word across the narrow sea and across Andalos, causing many Andals to cross and make new homes in the Vale. The Andals would go on to take what remained of the First Men's lands, as the First Men had no armies to protect them. The last of these First Men would become bandits, outlaws, and live in the mountains preying on the weak to survive. They are the mountain clans now, but to most they are free folk, like the ones that live beyond the wall. The major clans are the Stone Crows, Milk Snakes, Sons of Mist, Moon Brothers, the Black Ears, Sons of a Tree, the Burned Men, Howlers, Red Smiths, and Painted Dogs. Surrounded by the mountains, it is still possible to attack the Vale. There is a high road connecting the Riverlands and the Vale. It's guarded by the Bloody Gates, built during the reign of King Osric Aaron V. Along the coasts with an narrow sea, the Lords of the Vale have constructed powerful castles to protect the Vale from enemy fleets. The Fingers are protected by sturdy watchtowers, which have beacons to warn the others of enemy ships. Sometimes, the Endal Kings would sally out from the Bloody Gates, conquering parts of Westeros. When the odds were against them, they would pull back into the Vale, knowing their enemy wouldn't be able to give chase. The city of Goldtown has been the main port for fleets of the Vale. The Aaron Kings would construct warships to guard their trade fleets, as trade was an important part of the Vale economy. North and east of the Vale lie many islands, some too close to host populations, while others large enough to hold small towns. Using their fleets, the Lords of the Vale would conquer these islands. King Alistair Aaron II took Arwen Upcliffe as his wife, securing Aaron rule over each island, home to House Upcliffe. The island of Pebble was taken by King Hugh Aaron the Fat, and the Paps were conquered by his grandson, King Hugo Aaron the Hopeful. The Three Sisters would be the strongest of the island foes. These islands were home to cruel pirate kings, full of raiders and reavers. Their ships would sail the narrow sea, the shivering sea, and the bite, taking huge amounts of gold and slaves. The Kings of Winter sent their northern fleets to conquer the Fiestering Islands. The Chronicles of Longsister tell of the horrors of a northern fleet. Horrors of a northern conquest.
of a wild Northman who would kill children and then cook them, soldiers who would pull the entrails out from living men, and the 3,000 brutal executions at Hedman's Mount, which took place in a single day. Belfasar Bolton created a huge pink tent made from the flayed skins of the sistermen. The survivors of a brutal Northern conquest traveled to the Vale, seeking the help of King Mathos Aaron II. The sistermen agreed to kneel to the Aaron King in exchange for their help. King Mathos' wife questioned his involvement in the war, and he told her that he would rather be neighbors with pirates than wolves. One hundred warships set course for Sisterton. King Mathos Aaron never returned, so his son continued the war. The struggle between the Vale and the North lasted for a thousand years the sisters becoming their battlefields. The Northmen landed in the fingers and the Veilmen sailed to the White Knife to burn the wolves then. The Kings of Winter burned the air and fleet at Goldtown, and the sisters changed hands half a dozen times. Eventually, the Vale ended up ruling the sisters. Queen Marla Sunderland briefly ruled the sisters after Aegon's conquest, but her rule ended when a Bravosi fleet, hired by the Northmen, appeared on her coasts. The Queen's brother kneeled to the Targaryens, and the Queen became a silent sister. Archmaester Preston wrote in his book a consideration of history, but of the Vale only one of the sisters because the Northmen lost interest. This is a quote. For ten long centuries, the direwolf and the falcon had fought and bled over three rocks, until one day the wolf awoke as from a dream and realized it was only stone between his teeth, whence he spat it out and walked away. The House Aaron comes from the purest and oldest line of Andal nobility, like many other houses in the Vale. The Aarons could trace their line back to Andalus itself, a land in Essos. Some claim that they are descendants from Hugar of the Hill, the first Andal king. However, when tracing the lineage of a house as ancient as House Aaron, the line between history and legend becomes blurred. King Ardis Aaron, the Falconite, was most likely real, and the Battle of the Seven Stars had been recorded by so many that it likely happened as well. But there was also a second Ardis Aaron whose legend is far older than the Falcon Knights. This Ares was known as the Winged Knight, and he lived during the Age of Heroes. This ancient and first Sir Ares, the Winged Knight, rode on the back of a huge falcon. With the amount of creatures spoken of in ancient times, I believe this could have been possible. In Essos, they speak of creatures like the Sensars, and have skeletons to prove their existence. The dire wolves of the North were massive versions of the normal wolves, and beyond the wall, they speak of giants and giant spiders. After hearing about those creatures, a giant falcon doesn't seem so far-fetched. Artis commanded an army of eagles, and to win the veil, he flew to the very top of a giant's lance, where he battled the king of the griffons. His wife was one of the children of the forest, and he was friends with giants and merlings. There are hundreds of tales told about him that are just like this one, and are the same as the ones in the West Ruins about Land the Clever, or Bran the Builder in the North. In his own time, he likely wasn't known as Ardis Aaron, because the Aarons arrived when the Andals did, long after the Age of Heroes. Over the ages, singers and storytellers probably fused their tales together, and that's probably where the confusion stems from. In Legends, there was the Winged Knight, and in History there was the Falcon Knight, but both are known as Sir Ardis Aaron. When Ardis Aaron had the falcon crown placed upon his head, House Aaron would forever be known as part of the history of the Seven Kingdoms. After Aegon Targaryen conquered Westeros, the Aarons were named Wardens of East. The Aarons fought off slavery fleets from Volantis, raiders from the Sisters, reavers from the Iron Islands, pirates from the Stepstones, and others like the captains of the Basilisk Isles. Unlike the tales of old from House Stark, the Aarons recorded their deals in books and scrolls. After King Ronald Aaron flew on the back of a Targaryen dragon, he was named the first Lord of Eyrie. Queen Rhaenys Targaryen betrothed Lord Aaron to Lord Torrin Starts, daughter, in an attempt to create a peace between the Starks and the Aarons, but the young King Ronald was murdered by Janos the Kinslayer. Three times House Aaron had been worthy of marrying the blood of a dragon. Roger Aaron was wed to Princess Della Targaryen, and their daughter, known as Aima Aaron, was wed to King Viserys Targaryen I. Princess Rhaenys contended for the Iron Throne with her half-brother Aegon Targaryen II. Jaina Aaron was the Lady of Eyrie and a French Queen Rhaenyra Targaryen. She was the regent for King Aegon III. After those events, every Targaryen who sat the Iron Throne contained Aaron blood. When the Blackfires rebelled, House Aaron fought with the Iron Throne, supporting Targaryen rule. Lord Donald Aaron bravely led the vanguard in the first Blackfire Rebellion. 
His Vale forces were crushed by Daemon Blackfire, but Sir Gwain Corbraith of the Kingsguard saved his life with reinforcements. Lord Donal Aaron lived and saved the people of the Vale from a great plague during the spring. The Vale and Dorne were nearly unaffected by the plague. Lord John Aaron helped Robert immensely during Robert's rebellion, as he never brought the heads of Eddard and Robert to King's Landing like he was supposed to. If he had, the Targaryens would probably still rule the Seven Kingdoms. The Aarons fought bravely in the Trident, and Lord John Aaron served as Hand of the King to Robert. One could call the Eyrie the most spectacular castle in all the Seven Kingdoms, and they wouldn't be wrong, unless they were speaking to a Tyrell. There are seven grand towers that pierce the sky, already atop the Eyrie, which itself sits high on the giant's lands. Most of the castle is built in marble, and because of that, it is a pale, white color. There is not a single army that could take the Eyrie by force, through conventional means, but every castle could be brought down from within. The Eyrie is the smallest castle to host a great family in the Seven Kingdoms. The Aarons did not always make their home within it, however. The Gates of the Moon is a far larger fortress at the foot of the giant's lands, and it's the original seat of House Iron. It was built on the site of a Falcon Knight's war camp. King Artis did not mind that the Gates of the Moon did not look like a castle built for kings, as he spent most of his rule in his saddle. He said that his throne was his saddle, and his castle was his tent. After the death of King Artis, his sons took the throne. The fourth Aaron King was the one to begin construction on what would later be the Eyrie. His name was Roland, and he spent his time in the Riverlands, fostered by a different Dandel King. He traveled to Maidenpool and other great places in the Seven Kingdoms before returning to the Vale to wear the Falcon Crown. He thought that compared to Casterly Rock and the High Tower, the Gates of the Moon paled. His first winter in the Vale, thousands of wildlings attacked in search of food. Roland decided that the Gates of the Moon were not safe enough to host the Kings of the Vale. After being told the tale of the Falcon Knight's victory over Robar II using the High Ground by Lord Hunter's daughter, Roland decided to take the highest ground in the Seven Kingdoms. Clearing the path to the top of a giant's lance took a decade, and afterwards, thousands of masons worked on a staircase to make ascending to the Eyrie easier. King Roland sent forth his men in search for the best marble in the Seven Kingdoms. During a fierce winter, a wildling horde ambushed the king, and his skull was smashed with a stone mace wielded by one of the painted dogs. After 26 years, he had only lived to see a single marble block laid down where the Eyrie would later sit. The construction lasted for generations. Marble was sent by ship from the island of Tarth, and hauled up the giant's lance by mules. Master masons, workers, and mules died as they brought the stones up the giant's lance, but the castle slowly grew. King Roland, the second of his name, halted construction on the Eyrie, instead choosing to spend the Golden War in the Riverlands. Many petty kings were felled by Roland's army, but he eventually clashed swords with King Tristafer IV, the Hammer of Justice. Roland's forces were defeated by this fierceman king, and then again a year later, fleeing to the castle of Saman the Lord, he was betrayed and returned to King Christopher. After a four-year campaign, the Endel king was beheaded at Old Stones by the fierceman king. His brother Robin Aaron donned the falcon crown and ordered the construction of the Eyrie to resume. Four kings and forty-four years later, the castle was finally completed. Maester Quince of the Citadel was the first maester of the Eyrie, and said that the Eyrie was the most splendid castle ever built by man, a place worthy of the gods. The castle has been the seat of House Aaron ever since, summer, spring, and fall. During the winter, ascending the giant's lands becomes too dangerous and the castle is abandoned. Never before has the Eyrie been taken by force. To even get to the Eyrie, an invading army would have to take the Gates of the Moon, and then on their way up to the Giant's Lands, they would have to fight their way through three smaller castles named Stone, Snow, and Sky. It's highly unlikely that any army could take those five castles, fighting uphill the entire time. If, by some miracles, attackers made it through the first four castles, they would still need to climb a ladder or be winched 600 feet into the sky before reaching the Eyrie. No one believed that the castle would ever fall. Well, that was until Visenya Targaryen flew to its beak on the back of her dragon Vagar. The final Aaron King gave the falcon crown to Visenya Targaryen, and the line of Andal Kings came to an end. 
Thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, let me know by leaving a like. Sharing my content also helps this channel grow. If you thought this video was terrible, let me know in the comments down below and what I could do to change and improve it in the future. I've been Maester Atel, and I hope to see you soon.